right. Thank you, everybody, for joining us on this wonderful Sunday morning during a totally new time period. This is Coffee with Money, and we're doing a series called Interesting Minds, Interesting Times. And today I have the absolute pleasure of introducing Dr. Mark Schneep. He is the director of the California Economic Forecast in Santa Barbara. As he has told me, I will share with you this um, information changes so fast. So please, please, um, he'll tell you where to go if you want updates to find out what's happening. And with that, Mark, I'm going to turn this to you. Um, it, is, it is you. Thank you very much. Go ahead. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, so I, uh, needless to say, I'm going to talk about the economy today uh, and the impact that uh, the pandemic is having on uh, the US and California. And uh, all this information is as of today because it changes so rapidly, April 26th. So just real quickly, uh, what we know to date about uh, the pandemic uh, and its impacts on the US and California economies and how long is the damage that we're seeing now, how long is that going to persist? So I wanna talk about the outlook for 2020 going into 2021. Uh, and how we recover from this pandemic and the economic carnage that we're currently uh, experiencing. So again, all this is as of right now, uh, April 26th, because uh, conditions do change and we'll talk about that going forward. Okay, so here through Friday is uh, worldwide cases every single day, new cases coming on and uh, we, we are seeing a downward movement. So. The curve is uh, certainly starting to flatten out. Uh, it's not coming down rapidly, but it is flattening. Uh, in uh, California, in the Bay Area and Southern California, we can see it definitely uh, improving substantially in terms of the uh, percent growth in cases per day. So <clears throat> that's very uh, uh, encouraging that we're seeing uh, these declines overall. But we're trying to get to a, 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 a situation like South Korea has where the number of new cases is virtually none now every day. So that they've really flattened their curve uh, as well as a few other countries. So that's, that, that's where we're trying to head for. <clears throat> so real quickly, in summary, uh, the panic uh, from March and early April, I think has settled down. As of about uh, 20 minutes ago, we had nearly 3 million cases worldwide. We're not quite there yet. The U.S. is the leader, uh, as well as uh, United Kingdom and Spain. Those three countries are the most. We're now seeing uh, accelerations in Russia and Turkey. Uh, Italy and other parts of Europe, uh, there's a deceleration of cases or growth is coming down, like we're seeing it in Southern and the California and the Bay Area. The fastest case growth rate is still New York State, but the growth rate is diminishing. Uh, we're seeing com uh, very strong containment, and as I showed you, South Korea, then Singapore, Aus Australia, Thailand, and a few other countries, including China. In fact, China is uh, largely returning to uh, normal situations, at least economic wise. The economy is ramping up. If it was very slow in February, but uh, picked up speed in March and is even picking up more speed now. It had a terrible first quarter in the Hubei province, which is the epicenter of where uh, Corona started. GDP has been uh, revealed that it was down nearly 40% for the first quarter, which breaks all records of all times in China. Uh, supply chains from China, which are important to California and the rest of the nation are being restored. 95% of the enterprises are back. Schools are all open to even Disneyland. <laughs> even Disneyland has opened. It's been open since early March. Okay, Apple's opened all of its stores and so, so has Starbucks. So we are seeing this. I mean, China doesn't, isn't really uh, uh, forthcoming about a lot of uh, facts or figures with respect to this pandemic, but we do know that the economy is opening uh, rapidly now. Okay, so what about the U.S. economy? Well, it, it's really important for me to, to paint this picture here. Uh, I'm going to tell you the story. You, you pretty much know the story, but it's important that I connect the dots here <clears throat> and, and provide some of the details. 
uh, when we were going to make a forecast in February for the 2020 year, we were thinking another boring year of growth for the U.S. economy. Uh, that there wasn't much negative economic news uh, out there. The stock market was at record highs. The unemployment rate was at three and a half percent, record lows. We were thinking maybe 2% this year. That's what the models were saying. And we were at 2.3 last year. And actually, it was more encouraging in 2020 because um, the cloud over the economy, which was the US and China trade war, that was dissipating. And we had signed phase one on the 15th of January. Our unemployment rate was 3.5%. That's the lowest since the 1960s, 50 year low. That was February. Job openings, we had millions of them in February. Now, how many do you think we have? Quite a stark contrast, uh, but we had lots of job openings. We couldn't hire people fast enough. Recruitment was a nightmare for most firms. Housing starts were really starting to accelerate in January and February of this year. We were at the highest level since 2006, going into February. And the index of leading indicators, which had been moving lateral through 2019, actually bumped up in January and February of this year. So we saw a little breakout indicating that there were even less chances of recession on the horizon for 2020. But everything turned sharply on a dime, okay? We, uh, the pandemic hit the uh, stock market like a shock wave and then the economy all within like three weeks. Uh, securities market had made record highs in February, but in late February ravaged the securities market. Now it's ravaging the economy and investors are just now seeing and will continue to see the extent of the kind of damage we are seeing in not only the economy, but in the stock market. Okay. And then the Fed didn't help much, although they, you know, they were trying to help when they cut the federal fund rate by 50 basis points and then followed that up by cutting it to zero. That created some panic in the stock market. But it also eased credit and it certainly symbolized that they were ready to stand by for easing credit for the business world. Let's talk about supply and demand. The supply issue certainly was first. And of course, that is when shipping containers filled with products for American businesses don't come to the ports, particularly in California, okay? Because they're all shut down in China. Then the travel bans limited tourist supplies into the US and California. And then the shelter in place orders closed everything. So we had limited supplies of almost everything else. Restaurants, bars, gyms, personal care, sporting events, entertainment, not supplying anything. And then that led to the demand shock. And consumers are not demanding, they're not spending due to, well, a host of things. The, one of the big ones, of course, is the wealth effect that they're feeling from a huge decline in their portfolios and their wealth situations from the stock market from them losing your, their jobs and their incomes, and just simply from the uncertainty that this pandemic has imposed on the world. Okay, so, and tourists aren't spending simply because they're not here or nothing's opened anyway, that they can't spend them. No events, no, no restaurants, no, no nothing. Chinese visitors, we should uh, mention, spent $4 billion in California alone last year. Now, what do you think that number is? It's, it's zero. Other impacts, the rapid collapse, of course, of the financial markets, uh, the lack of travel, the lack of any visitor spending, planes less than half full or, or not flying at all. Empty hotels, empty buses, empty everything. And then the great shutdown of public events. Uh, and I'll talk about this in a second. Uh, the flight to safety into the bond market, and that caused interest rates to collapse to all time historical lows. We haven't seen interest rates this low ever in the history of this country, even going all the way back to the Continental Congress, which was floating bonds back in the 1780s and 90s to pay for the Revolutionary War. The rates weren't that low then. Okay, so now here's the Dow the last 125 days of closings all the way up till the close on Friday. And we had a record high, the last one was on February 12th. And then of course, 
it went straight down in 21 days. We lost 35%. Now we have recovered a little bit. We were up about 28% since that low. So things aren't quite as bad, but still uh, everyone's down 25% uh, or about on their portfolios so far. Other impacts that we're seeing, well, the data coming out on the US economy is horrific, it's horrific. And it, you know the extent of the damage is simply clarifies itself with more of the indicators being reported into March. Uh, but the reporting is lagged, and so uh, it doesn't really provide a real-time assessment of exactly where we are now for policymaking. And so we have developed more current indicators of the labor market trauma. I'll show you an employment rate that we come up with shortly. But we try to estimate the extent of the damage now, and that's good because then we'll be able to report real-time on the extent of the improvement. Uh, which we're looking forward to any day now. Uh, here's the index of leading indicators. I showed you that earlier. It was on an uptick, but then March came out and it collapsed. It's the largest decline ever observed in the history of this index, which goes back 60 years. Okay, we're also seeing big declines in consumer sentiment and consumer confidence and other indicators as well. Massive job lay layoffs through the jobless claims, closed stores, closed schools, empty downtowns, a lack of traffic, of course, is an indicator. Longer delivery times from Amazon because of all the online purchasing, uh, out of stock grocery store shelves, the oil prices in a free fall, and stock prices down for oil companies and for airline companies and for commercial REITs and for hotel chains. Big, giant declines continue to be declines. Here's oil prices, the WEX Texas Intermediate Benchmark price for the US. It ended on uh, Friday about $17, $18 a barrel. That's the lowest price we've seen in 26 years. You gotta go back to the 1990s, 94 actually, before you get a lower oil price right now. Let me talk about the shutdown. You all know this, you've lived through it. But putting it all in one big list is just, uh, it's just mind boggling. It's, uh, it's mind blowing. So, uh, you know, we've had all the schools closed. That was kind of the, the catalyst for all this. Then the NBA season, then March Madness canceled. Um, then all the high school sporting events at the schools closed. Colleges, universities, they've all closed. Online classes only, all amusement parks. All parks have closed, like Disneyland, Universal Studios, Yosemite, all the national parks, all the skiing resorts, all over California. What a waste of all that snow. New York Broadway shows closed, closed shows everywhere closed. Major League Baseball season delayed, maybe closed too. Summer Olympics postponed. All the music festivals closed, canceled, Coachella. Ticketmaster says, hey, just to date, this was last week, 30,000 concerts. There'll be another 30,000. All entertainment events, mostly canceled. Conventions canceled. Conferences canceled. Travel from Asia, Europe, all banned. And then, of course, with shelter in place, we've had all bars, restaurants, wineries, breweries, everything closed down. That shelter in place is occurring in 42 states, even though we are now seeing some openings in Colorado, it opens today, and Georgia opened on Friday. The jobs, of course, that are most at risk of layoffs and unemployment are restaurants and bars. Restaurants and bars, most of the retail trade sector, except for food, and drugs, all amusement, all recreation, spectator sports, sporting goods stores, and then, of course, car dealers, car parts, hotels, anything hospitality oriented, health care, personal care, gyms, air, water, ground transportation, trucking, and then the business support services that would support businesses like conferences and meetings and everything else that goes on in business has been shut down sharply. And so that has led to massive claims for unemployment because people have been laid off. Okay, and so, I mean, these are striking pictures, right? So through, the, through um, April 18th, 25.6 million claims, just in the last four weeks. You know, that was our high during the Great Recession. 
So, you know, we've blown through that. We're nearly four times that amount right now. And in California, you know, we're at, uh, well, I kind of blew that by that quickly. We're at 3.6 million just in the last four weeks. And that doesn't include all the bottlenecks at these offices where people haven't been able to get through. So we're gonna see even more. Here's the unemployment rate that we've calculated. They only come out once a month and the one for March came out, but it was only 5.3% because again, it's taken during the first part of March where we weren't in shelter in place yet. So things had to close down, but here we are in real time. This was just last week and we're at 22.3 in California. The highest we got during the Great Recession was simply 12.3. It makes 12.3 look great now. Other impacts that we're seeing, uh, further declines in spending are coming from consumers because they've been staying at home and they're out of work and they're hit by the wealth effect in the stock market. Nearly all travel, all recreation, all amusement has closed down, is not available and no shopping except for food and medicine and online, of course. No automobile buying or very little, you can only buy stuff online and who does that? I mean, there is some of that, not much. And the larger durable goods like wash machines and dishwashers and microwaves, you're probably not doing much of that either. So if a recession does occur, <laughs> I say that does occur, it, it will occur if these effects on demand are sudden, okay, and we know they're sudden, if they're severe and we know they're severe and if they're prolonged. So that's the question. Is it prolonged enough? I mean, if we went back to where we were, say tomorrow or next week, we probably wouldn't be prolonged enough. There is a chance we could avert recession. But uh, so that begs the question, how long is the shutdown period? And uh, how long is it gonna be necessary? And furthermore, how are we going to recover? What are, is gonna be in place to allow us to recover? That, those are the big questions. Okay, here's further impacts. The difficulty finding face masks, real tough. You know, I have a, uh, uh, you can't find an N95 mask. I happened to open up my drawer and found one in my, uh, in my desk the other day and it was left over from California fires where they were handing them out for free. So I had one left over. Now you can't get one for less than $12.95 on Amazon. You can't even get them there because they're reserved for healthcare professionals. Um, all the construction stoppages. We were under construction, but uh, Governor Newsom stopped all that in California and we're seeing it stopped elsewhere across the country. That's, that was later on in the, uh, in the shelter in place period. Uh, we're, we're seeing commercial real estate rent and occupancy declines now. We haven't quite seen the business bankruptcy, but they're coming. Many small and mid-size will be coming and we see continued shortages at grocery stores. Facility shutdowns for oil and gas, extraction workers and support crews, that's all coming. That's already happened to some extent, but more is on the way. Are we seeing any benefits? Yes. All the major runs on the food stores for toilet paper and everything else is really boosting retail store revenues. It's doubling, they've doubled. Lower oil prices would normally be a big positive for American consumers. And I guess it is to some extent if you are driving, but there's no place to go right now. So you're really not being able to take uh, uh, benefits to that. And besides, lower oil prices are really a negative on the US economy because, well, the US is the largest producer of oil in the world. And so this hurts taxation to federal and state sources. It hurts revenues for oil companies and therefore it hurts jobs. Amazon is hiring, okay, to facilitate uh, all of the online purchases, which is about the only place you can buy other than a grocery store. Um, and Walmart's hiring. Amazon actually doubled. They're up to about 200,000. Domino's is hiring where I have it right there, Pizza Hut, Papa John, CVS, 50,000, 7-Eleven, Kroger. Thousands and thousands of jobs are being uh, created. So it's just not all one-sided here, but uh, these don't offset all the layoffs, needless to say. The healthcare industry is ramped up. Uh, the demand for uh, the PPE, of course, is generating hiring and medical device manufacturing. So there are some benefits. There is some hiring going on. So that's why 
job openings aren't zero right now. The stay-at-home workers are, are creating this record demand for you know ISP services, so Sonic, Cable, Com Comcast are rising. And then to deliver all the products from Amazon and other online uh, stores, you've got Postal Service and UPS hiring everywhere in all states. And the tech firms are hiring. Go on Indeed or Monster.com. They're looking for workers, particularly Oracle, Salesforce, Motorola. Lower interest rates will enable a lot more financing uh, once we ultimately can start looking at homes and buying in the housing market because those low interest rates are going to remain low. Okay, so purchases are gonna go up, refinancing has already gone up. Okay, and also the census is higher. It's unrelated because we just happen to have a decennial census this year, 2020, but 500,000 workers are being hired to administer and support the census going on right now. There's mortgage rates through Thursday of this past week. Uh, and Freddie Mac's down to 3.33. Again, some of the lowest rates ever observed in the history of mortgage rates. And that has caused a tremendous surge in refinancing. So here's the Mortgage Bankers Association survey of refinance volumes. It's never been this high, ever, in the history of the series. So we're seeing major movement. And this is gonna help consumers long run because it's going to lower their costs at a time in which they need their costs lowered because they don't have much income coming in for in many cases. Let's talk about California. The unemployment rate in California had dipped in February all the way down to 3.9 percent, lowest rate ever recorded in the history of the state. That's where we were just before the outbreak. Other things, well the economy was very strong and vibrant Okay, with low unemployment and maximum amount of job creation, home sales were rising again after a respite in prices and in sales after 2019. We saw prices come down a little bit, not much, but they did. And tourism was surging, particularly from foreign tourists. And most of those foreign tourists in California were Chinese visitors. Now, how many do you think are here? Zero. And lodging occupancy it was at record levels or near record levels in the major metro areas and for that matter all over California. See, we had very broad based job creation and one of our key engines of course is technology in LA and San Francisco or the general Bay Area uh, region. So uh, in, in fact it still is for that matter but it, uh, no, nevertheless it has been muted and then new development we're in a renaissance of new development projects in California. Apartment building, office and hotels surging in Northern and Southern California. The high-speed rail project is employing more people than ever before or was. And then all the fire rebuilds in Northern California in Sonoma and Napa and Mendocino and particularly in Butte with tens of thousands of homes being built there after the campfire destroyed so many. There is the picture of commercial and industrial investment in non-residential structures. And it was an all-time record high in 2018. It wasn't far behind in 2019. And we were on a path to be similar to 2019 this year when everything kind of stopped. The unemployment rate for construction workers is the lowest it has ever been since records have been kept. So this is how tight the construction market was going into March. And that's one of the reasons when you look at the Paycheck Protection Program loan funding, where the first round just finished and you look to see what sectors were obtaining those loans, construction was number one. Construction was number one because in construction employers wanted to maintain construction workers in order to continue with their projects once they could restart, because it's so difficult to find construction workers. So protecting them through the program was the best way that they could retain them once projects started. The same thing with technology, okay, in protecting their workers, manufacturing and healthcare. So that's where the principal, those were the principal recipients of that loan to protect workers going forward when we restart. And restaurants, of course, took out a bunch of loans in order to hire workers back once we restart. 
So how many people are impacted in California? Well, every sector, just like every place else, except for grocery and drug and home products and home repair. Uh, healthcare is even impacted. Uh, we've had shelter in place since March 15th for the Bay Area, the rest of California since the 19th of March. And only the essential critical infrastructure workforce is supposed to be able to remain at work. So what is that? Who is that? How many people is that? Well, we've done an accounting of that and match that to sectors. And we come up with 10.5 million people are in the essential industries classified as the critical workforce right now. So they can work. And then another 1.1 million are non-essential, but could work from home. A lot of those are gonna be professional services and technology. And so you add the two together, you get about 11.7 .7 million out of 17.7 .7 million jobs in California. That leaves 6.2 million vulnerable. Vulnerable to lay off, okay, and uh, unemployment, needless to say. And these are the, the, the ones that are most at risk. We've kind of talked about this already. It's the restaurants and the bars, any food outlet, Re and then the retail the non-grocery stores, and then administrative support for businesses and arts and entertainment, all the recreation, all the hospitality. Uh, very vulnerable and being laid off significantly right now. In fact, California is more impacted by the shutdown than other states. Why is that? Why is California more impacted? We're the largest tourism state and there is no tourism right now. We have more bars, restaurants, hotels, wineries, breweries, more national parks more theme parks, more amusement parks than any other state. We have more conferences and conventions which are held here. We have more professional sports teams located here. Name it, basketball, baseball, we got more. More year round concerts and performances because of the weather. More wine tasting tourism because of our wine regions. We've got more workers idled at the ports. We've got more ports. We've got Oakland, LA, Long Beach. So we're hit hard. We, I, we estimate about 37% of the workforce is vulnerable to layoff right now because of that. Is there any good news? Well, we're 40 day, about 40 days into the shutdown in California. And I, the good news is we're at rock bottom. We're at rock bottom right now. It, it, it seems like it will only get better from here. The number of unemployed today is likely to, be, to never be as high as it gets right now, okay? And we estimate there's 4.9 million people that have been laid off out of the 6.2 that are vulnerable. Very, and, and why are we at the rock bottom? Because very little of that federal rescue money has been received or it's now being received. So now it can be put to work to hire some of those people back. Okay, and, we are, and, and so we are going to be, see workers hired back, particularly as we open up and shelter in place in California should be lifted in, well, hopefully two weeks, maybe it'll be three. We're seeing it lifted everywhere else, uh, slowly. So I talked about Georgia and Colorado and South Carolina is tomorrow along with Mississippi and then another 26 states on Thursday of this week. Okay, so how long are, is the damage that we're seeing now and how do we recover? Well, um, it's entirely driven, as I say here in this bullet, by the public health issue and the po public policy prescriptions that are gonna be put in place to restart the economy. That's what it depends on. So tell me how long we're in shelter in place, how long we're confined to our homes. Also tell me how the, how the phased recovery is gonna go. Put an H on that ow there. And, uh, and then I'll give you a reasonable assessment of the damage and when we recover, okay? Right now, it's purely speculation based on how we assume the great shutdown of the pandemic is gonna be lifted. Um, it's all assumption, and part of that assumption is that we will not, which we thought we would before, but we know now we won't have a V-shaped or quick, rapid recovery. That's not gonna occur because it's all dependent on how the economy is gonna be allowed to open up. There will be limitations on capacity. There will be show social distancing protocols put in place. There'll be phased openings of some sectors, even of some regions. And as Governor Newsom here in California said, probably large public events are not going to open in the early phases of restart. 
So we believe that the shape of the recovery, if I can give you an image to look at, is going to be a tilted L rather than a V. And here, what does that look like? Well, here's take a look at this. This was 2019 growth. Okay, it was rising. And you'll see how this works out as I put this puzzle together. That's March. We go straight down. That's the second quarter of 2020 in, uh, in the economy. And this could be any economic indicator that you could think of. And then a V-shaped recession where we come back to where we were before we went down, say by the fourth quarter of this year, uh, that scenario is gone. We don't see that now. Now we see a slow movement upward where we finally hit where we left off in March by mid 2022 or something like that. Okay, and then we continue on. So we're in for a slow period of resolve here. And why, why is that? Well, well, despite growth that we have over the last, well, that we're going to have over the next 18 months once we open up, Year two is kind of going to, it, there's going to be drags produced on the overall growth that we're going to see. Why? Because all the loan deferrals that you're seeing now by banks, they're going to expire. Banks are not going to continue this forever. And landlords aren't going to continue this for renters or for lessees in business. And the deferral programs of car loan payments, which you're seeing advertised all over TV right now, those will end. And the unemployment a bonus check from the federal government will expire. And the state unemployment benefits will expire in year two, which would be 2021. And the government stimulus monies will have been exhausted. And there probably won't be any additional government stimulus programs. At least we're assuming there won't be, certainly could be. Okay, so all those things produce a drag on the growth that will occur in 2021 as well as all the capacity limitations that we'll be experiencing. So here's our scenario. We peak in mid-April, okay, with clear signs of fewer infections, infections in May and for all states. Okay, so that's where we are now. We have peaked in mid-April, and we are seeing cluer, uh, or, uh, lower signs of infections. Even now, we don't have to wait till May, but we'll see it in all states in May. So shelter-in-place orders are eased in May, starting actually now. Airlines and other travel will be restored in June. Uh, actually, you could take an airline now if you wish to. Uh, there's been uh, business, business failures today, but, uh, but uh, most of them will survive through May. They may not survive beyond that, but we're assuming that they do. Workers return to their previous jobs, but there'll be so many fewer workers needed. So many. Why is that? Well, I think you can guess. Uh, consumer behavior for products is likely to be reticent. That and we're going to have these distancing and capacity constraints. So, there, you know, you're not going to need as many people to administer services or to provide, you know, goods because there's going to be less demand and we're not going to be able to take part of it as much as we did before. Schools are still a big question. Large events are unlikely to occur. Are we only going to be able to watch baseball on TV? Restaurants, maybe half capacity. I don't know. We'll be watching and observing how what happens in other states right now since they're the laboratory for this experiment. And then retail stores will be limiting shoppers, just like we're seeing the grocery stores limit us now. Mm -hmm. Airlines and hotels will face a slow return of consumers. So is this the new, the new temporary normal for the rest of 20? We are assuming so. That's what we're assuming. So here's how, the, how it looks. Here's GDP adjusted for inflation, we go straight down in the second quarter, that's now. We recover a little bit, but we're still down negative in the third quarter because of this very slow growth that, is, that occurs as a result of limitations on our restart. And then we have a better growth surge, we go positive in the fourth quarter, but we have slower growth in 2021, okay? Unemployment rate in the US, goes really high this quarter. It's actually higher than this now, but it gets diluted in Mar May and June uh, because peak workers go back to work. Uh, but we have a slow return of the unemployment rate down to where it was before this all happened 
gradually over time. It, has, it takes all the way to 2022 or longer. In California, our total employment goes straight down. We lose millions of jobs in the second quarter. And then we recover very slowly here, very slowly, because you know, we don't allow the economy to open rapidly up. So it's a slow slog getting workers back in position. So the unemployment rate will stay high. It moved higher in the first quarter. Here we are in the second quarter. It's actually higher than this, as I showed you, but it will start coming down in May and June. But it's a long process of getting it down to something a lot more palatable over time. That's the recovery that we face. So in summary, even if the, the, uh, we see a shutdown, uh, I mean, even if we see a lifting of the shutdown on May 1st, and we are going to be seeing that, we're already seeing that, we're facing much slower growth because of the serious supply limitations that are being imposed. The elimination of large events, uh, and that's of course, in turn, limits consumer spending and all the revenues earned by these companies. There will be an attendant decline in demand from households as well because of their reticence. Uh, uh, they've chosen to alter their preferences in order to maintain social distancing, avoid crowded spaces, and they simply lost their jobs or many of them have lost revenues from their businesses because demand has come down. So demand is limited, supply is limited all the rest of this year. So the recession persists into the summer months and depending upon how the limiting goes, the protocols are put in place during the restart, uh, we may endure recession all the way through September, finally picking up in the fourth quarter. And joblessness will persist as well because of the lack of consumer demand. Okay, so the good news is that interest rates will remain low and that should help housing and other interest rate sensitive sectors lead us during the recovery. Inflation is non-issue and construction, which was so strong before we went into this, will start up again and that will help to lead regional economies back to life as well. Also, we won't have as much impact on automobile and home sales, at least we don't believe. Okay, so take a look here. We're going straight down here. That's March and those two lines go down in terms of vehicle and home sales. This is an index for the two. Uh, here was the Great Recession, the shaded area, and you can see they slowly declined over time. We don't, we're not gonna face that. We went straight down uh, and we're likely to come out of this, not straight up, but we're likely to have a better recovery in autos uh, and in homes, homes in particular, because mortgage rates are gonna stay low. Inventory is low, both new and existing. It's just remained that way for many years. There still is a need and significant demand for uh, homes that hasn't been significantly altered. I mean, some people will be impacted by losing their jobs and having their business revenues decline, but the jobs of the home buying population are a lot less impacted. Those that would be buying homes those jobs are less impacted. It tends to be the lower paying jobs that are impacted by the pandemic right now. The stock market rebound will help because that'll help restore wealth perceptions. And uh, we only see home price corrections being on the order of maybe 10 to 15%, not much more. I mean, that's not much. You might not even notice that much. But this is largely dependent on how the economy shapes up during the restart. And if there's additional collateral damage through lingering unemployment. So we've got to watch that very carefully before we can really make a strong forecast of the housing market going forward. The other thing to keep in mind is that going through into the first quarter of 2020, this year, we had debt levels for households at all time record lows. People really responded after the Great Recession where debt was so high, they really responded to getting their houses in order uh, because of the stigma uh, associated with that and how they, they couldn't afford everything and all the foreclosures. So that has been improved. So that doesn't weigh down on us as much as it did then and slow demand. All right, that is the general outlook 
for the economy and how we're going to recover, we continue to update uh, this process. So go to our website, californiaforecast.com and click on COVID-19 updates. And we contribute to that scenario, uh, changes in what's happening with the economy at least twice a week. So thank you. And, uh, that's the presentation today. Back to you, Michelle. Oh, thanks, Mark. We have, um, some questions that have come on through and, um, I'm just going to go ahead and read them. For everybody else that's listening, if you have a question and you would like to, you will see at the bottom of your screen, there should be a little Q&A uh, tab. If you click on it, you can write your questions and I'll go ahead and do it. So uh, first question we got, with big box stores like Lowe's and Home Depot, people are packing the stores and doing do-it-yourself projects. Why are these stores able to stay open, but local and small business stores are not? Do you have an answer to that, perhaps? Well, uh, you know, it, it, there has been uh, different uh, policy uh, responses by uh, in different states to how many of those stores and sections of those stores being open. So, yes, we are seeing an inconsistent uh, application of who gets to stay open and who doesn't across the nation. Here in California, yeah, all those big box stores can remain open because they sell food and they sell home supplies. And that's really the criteria of essential industry here in California. As long as you're selling stuff that is either food related, drug related, or home based uh, in order to run the home uh, or repair it or maintain it, uh, you, can, you can remain open. And of course they're inundated because all the restaurants are closed. And so uh, because uh, food away from home always used to constitute about 50% of our, uh, of the food purchased in this country, you close those all down and now you have to double up on the grocery stores. And, and so that's why the runs have occurred. Uh, but that will all moderate as soon as we can start opening restaurants, uh, dormitories, if we go back to school, cafeterias, food trucks, all those things start opening up again. Got it. Um, I think most of us agree um, with your findings that uh, a recession is highly likely. The question that comes that we got is, what is the likelihood, in your opinion, of actually seeing a depression? Well, a depression is really just a long recession that's pretty much all a deep one in which there is a long period of unwanted economic resources that are idled. Uh, and so we don't see that. We see growth, you know, starting to, uh, to uh, be unleashed again with uh, shelter in place, uh, shelter at home being removed gradually by all these states uh, and, and ultimately by California. So you'll start seeing growth and that's why you know, I commented that I think that the, one of the good news areas is we're at the lowest that we're going to be. And it all happened suddenly. And yeah, we all feel it and it's horrible, but uh, this isn't going to last forever. And uh, again, a depression would be a long recession uh, that really changes the psyche and the and structural effects of the economy. And, and we don't really see that occurring this time around. So look for growth to start certainly by the fourth quarter of this year, maybe earlier. Again, depending upon what guidelines we have to face during the restart. Got it. Uh, I have another question. Um, someone was asking, you mentioned with the real estate market, uh, the potential of maybe just a 10% below list of prices. One of, the, one of the attendees said, if I were in the market to purchase a home, would a 10% below listed price be a reasonable thing to do based on current uh, conditions? Should, should they make that as an offer at 10% below listing? What are your thoughts on that? Uh, I don't think. <laughs> I know it's, it's, it's a double use. Well, first of all. You have to wait no. till they start going down. Yeah, or... it, uh, yeah. in order to convince sellers that prices you know, could decline. They may not decline. Who knows? Because again, this, this, if people are waiting, if people believe that this is their opportunity, you know, another opportunity like we had back in 2009, 2010, 2011 to buy housing cheap, I don't think it's going to be the same kind of opportunity at all. 
basically because the, the recession back then was really epicentered in housing. Now it has really nothing to do with housing. And we don't have much housing there. And, and we have fundamental supply and demand factors shaping the housing market today. Whereas back then we had speculation, we had housing bubbles, we had all kinds of distortions in the housing market. We don't have those now. So, uh, and we don't have uh, uh, homeowners that are overextended and we don't have financing terms that are too liberal and uh, lead to uh, uh, default. So uh, no, this is probably not going to be a golden opportunity to buy housing. Uh, should one uh, bid 10% less? If you can convince the seller, the sellers may be really afraid that housing is going to go down a lot more and they may jump at a 10% reduction in their price thinking it's going to go down even more. So it's probably worth a, a factor, a, a try anyway. But uh, I, th I think that you're going to need to see some price contraction before sellers will be convinced that perhaps it's going that way. Okay. I understood. Thank you. That's a hard one. And we haven't seen that yet. In fact, the data through March show that prices continue to rise. So <laughs> we've seen no indication of price concessions, but there will be because sellers have to sell their homes in, in some cases. Um, and they can't do that right now because again, it's really hard to go and preview them. Uh, I have another question. Will large budget deficits have any impact on the recovery? And that's a very interesting one. We've got a lot of uh, huge debt and on the government. Do you think that's gonna have an impact on our recovery? Uh, the federal government, no. The federal government can, can be, uh, uh, can still cont continue to finance their debt and kick that can down the road for quite some time. But ultimately, yes, it, it, it's going to have an effect on taxpayers because that's all got to be repaid. So uh, ultimately, uh, but, but that's something that doesn't have to be addressed immediately. Now, state governments are a different story. They need to get their houses in order as quickly as possible. So, and look at, they're ravaged, terribly so. Um, they uh, haven't been able to earn uh, sales tax revenue. It's been cut sharply, and uh, and, uh, and and parking revenue and parking citation revenue all gone to zero. So uh, they've been hit very very hard by this, um, and the state revenues will be hit hard by uh, the lack of income tax. Uh, revenues because uh, California gets most of its revenues from personal income tax and stock options and things like that. Look what's happened in the stock market. So state governments will be hit hard. Then California is going to be hit hard, uh, and that that means that we're probably going to see tax increases, fee increases in California. Uh, so right when we didn't need any more of that because we've got some of the highest rates of taxation of any state in the country but look for that to go up in order to finance the deficits that we're seeing. So yes, that's gonna weigh in, but I think uh, you know that's gonna be small compared to just being able to get the general private sector economy back up and running as quickly as we possibly can. Another uh, question that came through was, to what degree do you think technology has kept our economy going? Um, and I'm thinking about even, you know, myself able to do video webinars and continue to do business that way. Um, I'm not typical of out there, but what do you think on that? How would you answer that? Oh, it's been huge. <laughs> yeah. Huge. Yes. Just like what you said, Michelle. Uh, and, and, and because of that, you, we're going to see longer term changes in the way we do business. Now we won't see a meet, you know, draconian changes immediately but but we will see changes like one of the things one of the things of course is using these zoom video uh meetings uh the the, the pandemic has forced businesses to get real literate with this form of technology not only zoom but go to meeting and and webex as well They've, it's forced business to get themselves going on this as quickly as possible and in a, for meetings and for communicating with their workforces. 
uh, and even for conferences. I've given a few conferences on Zoom now. Uh, so because they've become being able to get more comfortable with it during this crisis, they're going to start using it more. And so it's going to save on personal meetings going forward. It's going to save on other conferences. It's going to save on global travel, other travel. So they're going to be able to cut their costs, which they're going to need to do next year and the year after as, you know, because growth is going to be slow. So this is going to be huge for them, video conferencing. Okay. And of course, being able to have uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 Wi-Fi at home has probably been invaluable for everybody. And the surges that have been uh, able to be uh, accommodated by the ISPs, uh, this has been great too. So, and, and the technology companies to provide them with equipment. So this has all been extremely important during this pandemic, which will have lasting effects in the recovery and will help save business largely going forward. So yeah, I think it's been, it's been huge. It will continue to be. And uh, the last question before I let you go is how do you see, or do you see any changes in the manufacturing landscape in the United States with newfound resurgence of an interest in buying American made products? Yes, clearly. I, I think that uh, there's a stigma now <laughs> that's yeah. being created uh, from uh, uh, from uh, uh, products coming from China uh, and, and maybe elsewhere too, but uh, certainly China, uh, there's a lot of negative stuff associated with China right now. And you, and you see it on the news as well. Uh, and they were trying to provide tons of PPE to, to a lot of countries around the world. And a lot of it was faulty or defective. It had to be sent back. You know, Italy had sent so much to China and then China uh, tried to return it, but at a cost. <laughs> uh, so to Italy. So uh, yeah. So th th there has been some rough feelings. So and of course, uh, uh, we uh, we need to bring a lot of the manufacturing. A lot of it is being called back by uh, by con con uh, congressmen and, and senators uh, in uh, in the federal government. So look for. Uh, returns of supply change to some extent, manufacturing definitely coming back. That's going to increase the cost. The gains from trade are that we should have all that stuff made around the world or wherever it's more cheaply made. That's what makes us, uh, things much more competitive and less cost. But in the interest of security, going forward, we will probably move a substantial amount of that back, particularly uh, pharmaceuticals. So look for that to, to start occurring next year and the year after that. It's going to be very interesting to see how our relationship with China progresses uh, once this pandemic, we get control of the pandemic and we start to go back to normal. Yeah, it, it's, it's interesting. One last question that came in, um, if you can even speak to this, is when would you recommend someone look to refinancing their home? We mentioned that rates are going to stay low. Um, what do you? What would your thoughts be on that? Right now, this is it. I think the lowest it's going to be is right now. Okay, wow. or but there's a window. I mean, it's not like you have to rush out. But here's what we see: is you know, if things go well during the restart, which we all believe they will, although you know, a lot of public health decision makers are saying we could have a resurgence of this in the fall. And so uh, we won't necessarily shut things down, but it would produce a drag on the economy because people will become fearful and they'll start to shelter in place themselves voluntarily. And that could affect demand. And if it affects demand, then it affects purchasing, which would affect the stock market because of earnings. And so, um, you know, we need to be much more cognizant of uh, the fact that those kinds of things can occur going forward. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining. Um, Mark, thank you so much for your time. This uh, webinar was so informational. Um, I hope you'll consider coming back in several months and updating us when we know more what's going on. But everybody, have a great Sunday afternoon. And again, thank you, Mark.